Yes, all good, James. All good. All righty. Well, look, why don't we kick off? And um, now, uh, this is a, a slideshow which I made some time ago uh, in order to get a free lesson in a glider. Um, but it's actually quite an interesting topic um, because during World War II, uh, gliders were used in very large numbers. And um, but it's a it's a rare um, weapon which is, was only used just in that war. Um, if you look at the uh, the history of of gliders, although they were um, used in civil uh, applications, the military applications of gliders pretty much were confined to the 1939-1945 period. Um, so for those who uh, don't know me, uh, I'm James Oglethorpe and um, I'm an old mate of Rod's and I come from Three Squadron RAAF Association. And uh, I think tonight's uh, slides will take about maybe 40 minutes or so. So we'll see how we go. Um, you know, there's many weird and wonderful combinations of gliders. And one of the things people don't realize happened with them was they actually uh, made gliders that were big enough to carry tanks and here's an allied example of a, um, a Hamilcar glider carrying a little tank called an M22 Locust. Uh, these things were only used on a few occasions and uh, they, they actually weren't uh, much good against a proper battle tank, but on the other hand, they were uh, much better than nothing. So uh, anyway, we'll move on to why they were only used in the World War II. Um, they were a very important weapon during the war. Uh, they were firstly very cheaply mass produced, uh, often made of uh, non-strategic materials like wood and uh, often produced by non-strategic companies like piano manufacturers, furniture makers. Um, towing a glider with a, a plane like a DC-3, you actually doubled the load capacity of the towing aircraft so that the DC-3 could um, carry paratroops and the uh, the glider could carry glider landing troops and you could actually land more people on the ground uh, with the glider combination. Um, the other really big thing in their favour was that they could land on unprepared fields, that is that they could land anywhere that there was an open field and they approached very silently. So uh, they were used typically for um, airborne assaults and uh, all the big allied invasions uh, in World War II uh, ended up featuring gliders. Uh, this is a, a cut down section of uh, the most commonly produced glider uh, called the Waco or the CG-4A. This is the American mass produced um, glider of World War II. You can see the structure here is just uh, steel tubing, uh, basically some wooden reinforcement and then plywood skinning. Um, and the, the nose actually flipped up. So all of this uh, lever arrangement on top is to flip the nose out. Uh, it could actually carry up to a Jeep uh, with its crew uh, or more typically up to 15 troops. And the, um, in the American uh, army, the glider landing pilots uh, actually became part of the infantry combat group. Um, and interesting comparisons with the different uh, countries who use them. The same with the Germans, that their pilot basically put on a helmet and went into action with the troops. Uh, whereas the British pilots uh, actually tended to, uh, in, in some cases, they were Royal Air Force rather than being army. And uh, certainly in some of the early invasions, the pilots ended up wandering around as uh, basically accidental tourists instead of being involved in the battle. Um, the other interesting thing to note about this slide is that the, uh, the Waco glider, um, oh, actually, I'll Although I'm pronouncing it like the town in Texas, Waco, apparently the, the company name was Waco, <laughs> like, like really Waco. And um, so I've been corrected on this before. So, but um, as you'd be aware, there's a town in Texas called Waco, but the glider wasn't named after that. Um, anyway, and the total production of this thing was 12,393. So uh, if you think about um, modern day aircraft production like Airbus A380, they've produced about, I think, 250 or so. Um, 12,000 is just an enormous number. And uh, you can see how important they were in, in getting mass numbers of people uh, over the beach in the, uh, in the big invasions that occurred. 
Now, how did military gliders come about? Well, it was one of these things where force of circumstance, the Versailles Treaty uh, prohibited German military aircraft. That is, they said, you can't have any, you can't have any military aircraft. And um, the Germans immediately started working to get around this. And uh, one of the ways they did it was to train people in Russia and similar places. But uh, they also built up an enormous uh, glider organization and um, basically trained lots and lots of uh, youth pilots uh, to fly gliders. And uh, they encouraged a really vibrant uh, culture of these gliding clubs and uh, pushed the technology of gliding along very well. And there, were, there was a big emphasis on record setting as well. And uh, here you can see a picture of a, a glider practicing in the snow. Um, most of these gliders were launched by using rope tows. So the, the Germans didn't need even to have any tow planes. Uh, a rope tow is basically a, a, a winding mechanism that can be powered or even spring loaded and basically a great big uh, rope or, or bungee to pull the glider off into the wind. Um, now here's somebody you might know, Hermann Goering. Uh, in 1922, he said, it is by air power that we are going to recapture the German Empire. To accomplish this, we will do three things. Teach gliding as a sport to our young men, build up commercial aviation, create a skeleton military air force. And when the time comes, we will put all three together. <laughs> so there's a man with a plan. Uh, and it worked. The, the, uh, the Luftwaffe appeared out of almost nowhere in the mid 1930s. Um, Here's an interesting thing, which is a postcard that the, uh, the kids would send off to their friends when they got their C certificate, which is their, uh, their glider solo. And uh, you can see the little swastika on the glider and the, uh, uh, the happy ground crew. And all, all of these people inevitably would have uh, gone on to uh, create the backbone of the Luftwaffe in World War II. Another person involved with uh, the gliding boom in Germany uh, was Hannah Reich and um, a very famous person. Uh, she became quite an important figure in, uh, in German history actually, but uh, amazingly she set world records in gliders starting in 1931 and the very last one is in 1979. <laughs> so, um, and you'll see her pop up many times in this story, uh, but she was a pin-up heroine. She, um, basically got huge amounts of publicity. She was uh, very popular in the German press and the Nazi government, she uh, basically met all of the, the, uh, the big wigs in the Nazi government. She gained patronage, um, which means that there was budgets made available to help her go and set records. And um, this is a color picture of her off in Libya in 1939, uh, doing a, uh, a record flight. You'll see she's actually a very small person. Uh, that's uh, advantageous if you're a glider pilot, I imagine. Um, helps with your power to weight ratio, which you have no power, so you need minimum weight. Um, but Hannah also was instrumental in actually launching the military glider uh, into production because um, a company called the DFS company, which was a sports glider manufacturing company, they wanted to, to try and get a military contract and what they did was arrange a demonstration where they flew the prototype of a DFS 230 glider, which was the most uh, widely produced German glider in the end. Um, in 1937, um, Hannah actually flew the prototype right into a sports field where there were all these Nazi bigwigs uh, watching a, a military display and landed the glider right in front of their feet. And uh, the, the troops all hopped out with machine guns and, and got the drop on the on the delegates. So um, the Luftwaffe people were very impressed with this and they could see the application of, of a glider and uh, they got an immediate mass production order and DFS uh, basically produced gliders for the rest of World War II. Um, when the war broke out in 1939, uh, most of the other nations hadn't really paid any attention to German gliders and uh, uh, I think everybody assumed that the gliders were just a, uh, a cheap and cheerful way of getting flight training done. And um, the, the, although 
I think the DFS 230 gliders were known about, but they weren't really um, factored into anybody's strategic plans. And certainly nobody put anti-glider measures on top of any of the strategic objectives, which they, they then took. Um, but even within the Luftwaffe, um, the assault gliders really didn't have a wide support. The, the Luftwaffe was expanding very rapidly with modern powered aircraft. And what happened, though, is on the first day of the German invasion of the West, which uh, those of you who know the history will know that the phony war went for basically six months or more, uh, where Hitler did nothing on the Western Front and um, the British and French forces, Belgians, were all sitting waiting and um, the Maginot Line was considered to be impregnable. And so uh, everybody considered that the Germans would have a very tough job uh, trying to invade France again and, and refight uh, the battles of World War I. But what happened was that the key fortifications on the Belgian side uh, that were guarding the key railway crossings and the key canals and bridges, um, suddenly found German gliders landed on their roof. And the, the, the Germans had not just gliders as a secret weapon, but they also had shaped explosive charges. You know, a conical shaped explosive charge is the basis of an anti-tank rocket. It can blast through armor plate. And um, yeah, so the on the very first day, all of a sudden out of the dawn, um, came silent gliders. And I've got a picture here of a war gaming uh, scenario. And um, you can see that the fortress was actually carved out of solid rock. In World War I terms, it was quite impregnable. But if you landed a glider on the roof and you blew the top off the, uh, the, the, the gun cupolas there, then what happened was that the, the people inside the fort could do nothing. And in the end, they surrendered. And uh, the, you can see the fort was located near to uh, important bridges, you know, canals, uh, railways, all of the infrastructure was right here. And um, so they took out the key location with the gliders um, early on the first morning. And, and after that, the Panzers just drove straight through the gap. Uh, this picture actually shows uh, Hitler himself presenting iron crosses to uh, the various commanders of the, uh, of the glider troops. And in fact, they, they only did this one job. They, they cracked through the, uh, the West Wall and um, uh, there was no need to employ the paratroopers and the gliders again in uh, the battle in the West. As you know, France collapsed and, um, and Hitler, as he said, uh, oh, sorry, Churchill said the Battle of France is over and uh, the Battle of Britain will now commence. Uh, but the thing was that uh, although the Germans tried to keep it secret, uh, that the way that the, the fortress had been taken became common knowledge and uh, everybody started worrying about gliders. But um, before the Allied powers did very much, uh, the Germans took the whole glider idea off into um, really uh, gigantic fantasies. Um, the Battle of Britain uh, didn't go well for the Germans and they, they failed to get air superiority and therefore they failed to have sea um, access to bring an invasion fleet across the channel. So without the air superiority, they had to think up other ideas. And they came up with the idea of landing large uh, numbers of troops and also tanks, artillery, that sort of thing, in extremely large invasion gliders, a couple of hundred of them. And um, uh, this aircraft here is a, it's got engines on it, but it's, it's actually originally was a Messerschmitt invasion glider and later put engines on it. And as you can see, they're driving a half track and a large field gun um, into the, the belly of the, uh, of the glider. And uh, if things had gone slightly differently, then the, the home guard in Britain would have found themselves with um, tanks and, and German um, stormtroopers uh, basically dropped in their middle by these very large gliders. Um, but a few things happened. Firstly, uh, they, they, the Germans... Um, allocated really uh, crash programs to two aircraft manufacturers, Junkers and Messerschmitt. And uh, this is a picture of the, the Junkers design uh, called the Mammoth, the Mammut. And um, as you can see, it's, it's basically built of wood and uh, the pilot's sitting in a little cabin over here and then a very large um, cargo bay to hold the tank or, or the, the troops that were, it was meant to take. Um, 
Funnily enough, Junkers were ordered to build the plane out of wood and use only wooden construction, so it had to be non-strategic materials. But Junkers had been a pioneer metal aircraft designer in World War I, and they'd been building metal aircraft. At, they, they actually were, were, were one of the most skilled metal aircraft designers in the whole world, and yet they were told to do this crash program of, of producing wooden gliders. They had no equipment, um, they, they had no materials, they had no workforce, so they had to organise all of this. And they, to their credit, they actually went from drawing board to prototype in five months. However, and the trouble with that was that when they tried to fly the prototype, uh, a few problems uh, existed. Firstly, the Germans found they almost had no aircraft at all that were large enough to tow one of these gliders. So they actually used a, a Junkers 90, which was one of the very few planes in Germany that could pull it off the ground. And when they did get the prototype up in the air, they turned out to be really disastrously unstable. Uh, that is, you know, almost completely unflyable, although it, the pilot, to his great credit, managed to get it down without killing himself. Um, and the trouble was that they'd actually been building the other 90 gliders at, in parallel with the prototype. So, so they actually had another 90 gliders almost finished. And um, except the design was completely untenable, they couldn't modify it. And the entire, the entire project was then scrapped. And uh, the, the wooden gliders were sawn up for firewood, which cost the equivalent of 18 million US dollars for your firewood. Uh, so that was the end of half of the glider force. Uh, Messerschmitt had uh, better success. They were actually given an easier technical um, target, which was to build a plane out of metal tubes, steel tubes, uh, with basically a canvas covering. And uh, so Messerschmitt built this, uh, this large glider uh, called the ME321, the gigant, giant. And um, they made 200 of these. Uh, and but as you can see in the picture down the bottom here, again, they had this problem of not having any tow planes that were suitable for, for taking the, the glider off. And so the solution they ended up settling on uh, was to have three Messerschmitt 110 fighters um, towing on cables which went through pulleys. So there was sort of a Y-shaped arrangement and a pulley, and then a Y-shaped arrangement and another pulley, and then a, a tow rope going back to the glider. And then the glider had assisted takeoff rockets as well. And all of this was required to get the stupid thing off the ground. And um, this arrangement uh, was fraught with peril and there were many accidents. The worst one um, had 129 fatalities. The, the glider was actually carrying a fully equipped group of troops. And the Germans hushed the whole thing up at the time, but it was actually the world's uh, biggest aviation disaster for many years to come, I think until the 1960s. Uh, uh, and uh, Hannah Reich uh, again appears in the story. She actually took the fifth uh, prototype up. Uh, apparently, the controls were, it, it had very simple controls, no powering of the controls. And, um, you know, so long cables going through to the control surfaces. And the, the load for the pilot was incredible. And the load for a little girl like Hannah was very great. And eventually, they put a second pilot in the things uh, to help with the control loads. Uh, but anyway, Messerschmitt got 200 of them produced. And, um, but by the time that this production was, was ready, uh, the window of opportunity to land gliders in Britain had pretty much passed and Hitler's attention had been attracted by, by um, Russia. And um, so the, the gliders ended up being sent to Russia to carry cargo. Uh, eventually, the Germans worked out how to make a sufficiently powerful tug for the thing. Um, they joined together two Heinkel 111 bombers <laughs> with a fifth engine. So um, this, this looks like something out of uh, science fiction, but anyway, the, uh, this is what they ended up doing. And so this, this tug called the Heinkel Zwilling or twin um, could tow the ME321. Uh, this, by the way, this dolly underneath was dropped as the plane took off. And um, it then landed on skids when it got to its airfield in Russia. Uh, trouble being then that the ground crew had to come along and jack it up and, and, and put other wheels on it in order to get it, um, usually to have another flight to another airfield further ahead. And um, you ended up with a, a, 
an enormous immobile disaster. You know, you can imagine the, the slush and snow in Russia. Uh, so these things were, were not, uh, not working well to use the gliders as cargo carriers. Um, so <laughs> they, they never did end up using them for any uh, glider assaults. Uh, but, oh, and by the way, they, they proposed to invade Malta with them. Um, but the trouble was the Germans were relying on the Italians to actually provide most of the military to invade Malta. And Goering said after the war, you try getting the Italians to invade something. <laughs> so Malta never got invaded either. And um, what happened though was to deal with this, uh, the enormous logistic problems of trying to move the glider once it didn't have its wheels on anymore, uh, they basically redesigned the glider, took the basic gliders and then fitted six French engines to them and uh, built an undercarriage with multiple wheels, which was quite good for rough um, landing conditions. And um, it became surprisingly quite a, a successful and certainly very large capacity cargo carrier. Um, and these things uh, did a sterling job for the, for the Germans in moving um, large amounts of cargo backwards and forwards. The, uh, the German troops used to call it the Lukaplaster bomber, which meant the sticking tape, uh, sticking plaster bomber, you know, band-aid bomber because the canvas skin used to apparently rattle alarmingly in the wind. Um, and the, the Germans kept, kept on using them, but then um, a large number of them were shot down trying to sustain the German defence in Tunisia in uh, 1943, April and May. Um, and you know, basically they, they were hacked out of the sky by Allied fighters once the Allies got air cover over the, the top of the German, um, you know, uh, force area. But anyway, that was the end of the Messerschmitt uh, 321. And um, I think some ME 323s survived till the end of the war, but, uh, and uh, the, the Germans actually kept on putting more and more machine guns on them. So the ones that survived often uh, had amazing stories of running battles with Russian fighters and that sort of thing. But anyway, we'll get back to a, an actual use of gliders again. But the next time the Germans used um, gliders, was uh, in the Battle of Greece. You'll be aware that the, uh, the British landed troops in Greece, including um, uh, a British armoured division, but also Australians and New Zealanders. And the Greeks had been quite successfully uh, keeping the Italians out. Italy had tried invading from Albania into Greece and the Greece, Greeks had successfully uh, counterattacked and pushed the Italians back um, into, into Albania. And, um, at this stage, Hitler had to come to the rescue of the Italians and uh, invaded Yugoslavia and then down into Greece and uh, amazingly met the, uh, uh, the Australian forces around Anzac Day uh, of 1941. Uh, and uh, they were actually defending the Pass of Thermopylae, the, the famous Spartan uh, battlefield on Anzac Day. And uh, on the 26th of April, the day after, um, the Germans decided to use gliders and paratroops to cut a vital bridge on this narrow neck of land called the uh, Corinth Isthmus. And uh, see, Corinth is so narrow that there's actually a canal cut through the, uh, through the peninsula. And you see a boat being towed here, but these bridges going over the top are, um, were vital communication links and the allied armies were streaming over these bridges in order to get down to um, the uh, Kalamata area and others in the south where they could uh, join ships and get away to Crete and the Egypt. And so the Allied evacuation was um, suddenly stopped by the Germans capturing this bridge. Um, but well, just a few minutes after the Germans took the bridge, they'd taken off the explosive charges and stacked them up next to the bridge and a British anti-aircraft gun managed to set off the explosives. And this is an actual picture taken from the bottom of the canal uh, showing the, the explosives going up on both sides and the bridge actually falling down into the water. Um, so the Germans couldn't use the bridge to pursue the Allies and therefore all the Allied soldiers that were on the southern side of the bridge got away, including many Australians. About 12,000 um, were shipped out from the, the southern parts of Greece. Now, um, the Germans then uh, basically used all of their resources for their next big plan, which was to invade Crete uh, using 
uh, airborne troops, paratroopers and gliders. And um, so we're talking about 20th of May, so it's about a month later than the, the Greek battles. And the Australians and New Zealanders and other British troops uh, on Crete had the enormous advantage of having um, code breaking information uh, from the German Enigma codes. And so they actually knew what the Germans' targets were, which were uh, three airfields on Greece. And um, so they, the Allies basically were able to set up um, defences around uh, these uh, airfields. And uh, they took a terrible toll on the German uh, Junkers 52 uh, para paratroop uh, carriers coming in. Um, Oh, and by the way, Rod's uh, name of uh, Fallschirm Jagger, Jagger, <laughs> means um, Fall Stopper Hunter, which is, means paratrooper. And there he is. And, and this was the, uh, the Valhalla of the, um, the Fallschirm Jagger. They, um, they basically uh, uh, suffered enormous casualties trying to take these well-defended airstrips. But gliders actually played quite an important role in getting one of the key airstrips open because um, the gliders actually came down near the New Zealand anti-aircraft guns and the glider troops were able to actually capture and blow up the guns. And, um, and that made the critical difference in the, uh, the battle. And uh, basically then the Germans were able to roll the Allies along the coast of Crete uh, once they started getting uh, sea forces landed as well. And, but the German losses were incredible. They lost 400 aircraft, which was half of the German transport fleet, and over 4,000 killed of these elite troops. And ironically, Hitler then basically forbade any more German airborne assaults. Um, now, the Russian invasion hasn't started at this stage, but if the Germans had used airborne in Russia, they probably would have had more success than they, they did anyway. And that may have made a critical difference in getting to Moscow before the winter set in. But anyway, we'll never know. But anyway, this, this was Hitler's idea that he had no more airborne assaults. And um, the paratroopers uh, then fought as elite ground troops uh, thereafter uh, in many battles, such as Monte Cassino in Italy and uh, in Normandy. And um, they, they were a very tough uh, nut to crack uh, fighting those particular troops. Uh, funny enough, though, that almost the same moment that, um, uh, that Hitler cancelled German airborne assaults, um, Churchill had been very, very impressed by the German success on Crete. And um, on the 27th of May, while the battle was still raging, he said, we've got to have an airborne division on the German model, which meant uh, gliders, paratroopers, the whole lot. And, uh, and this was the start of a truly massive Allied building program uh, to uh, create these uh, these glider forces and the other uh, paratroop forces. Now, so that's all occurring back in 1941, and it wasn't the Allied um, airborne forces didn't really get a run until the 9th of July 1943, when the Husky invasion of southern Sicily, Sicily was undertaken. And by this stage, there there have been many different Allied glider models produced, and the Husky invasion included 2,000 British troops in flying in uh, 144 American gliders. This is, uh, again, it's our, our wacko glider, um, but the British call them Hadrians. Uh, but anyway, it's, it's an American mass-produced glider, and they even had American stars on there, you can see. As you can see, this one came down in the water, and there was, uh, sadly, enormous confusion during the invasion that the... Um, the glider forces uh, suffered uh, navigational difficulties. There were strong winds and other problems. And then uh, they actually went over the top of the invasion fleet, who then opened up on them with anti-aircraft weapons. And a lot of the tow planes actually then pulled the plug and let the gliders go. Um, some of the gliders actually were towed all the way back to Africa and landed without participating in the battle. But, um, and, and uh, as it says here, about 250 of the glider troops actually drowned. Uh, so that would be the equivalent of, uh, you know, maybe uh, a dozen, two dozen or more gliders worth of people. And um, however, some of the gliders got launched in the right spot and they, they actually landed around the key objective, which was a thing called the Ponte Grande Bridge. 
and uh, they managed to defend it for the rest of the day until the uh, the troops could roll up from the beach and actually uh, relieve them. So, so the glider assault actually worked, and um, this bridge was vital in getting their uh, the Allied troops out of their their beaches in southern Sicily. Sicily. Um, Now, a little later in 1943, the, um, the Sicily invasion led to the successful Battle of Sicily. And then uh, in September of uh, 1943, the Allied invasion of Italy. Now, the Allies and the Italians had been speaking secretly, secret negotiations, to try and arrange a surrender by the Italians. Uh, the, the Germans found out about this and uh, basically prepared a, a very efficient plan to uh, dispossess the Italians of, uh, of all the key military installations in Italy when, when the changeover occurred. But um, the Italians changed sides from Axis to Allied at the same moment that um, the Allied invasions went in to uh, uh, the, the toe of Italy and the Salerno landings in the, uh, up, up on the shin of Italy near Naples. Um, and as part of the Italian government uh, basically deciding that they were, they, they felt like they'd lost the war and they wanted out, um, Mussolini was deposed by his own side and uh, was put into a mountaintop hotel uh, called on the Grand Sasso Mountain. And uh, this is a very remote place. It's, the hotel is uh, literally uh, perched right up in the air on top of an alp. And... Um, it's right in the center of Italy. It was a, a very good place to imprison somebody if you didn't want them to be uh, rescued, except if the rescuers are using gliders to come in because the gliders could come in and basically land on the 100 meters or so of grass that was outside the hotel. And um, uh, the, they also uh, used braking parachutes on these gliders so to make sure they didn't go off the other side of the mountain. And uh, here the, there's an excellent set of uh, German propaganda photographs of the uh, of the glider assault on Grand Sasso. Uh, and you can see the, uh, the same standard German uh, DFS 230 glider. And anyway, Mussolini was then put into a, a tiny little German communications aircraft, a Fliesler Stork. And the Stork um, again rolled over the 100 meters or so of grass, went off the cliff and just disappeared straight down the, the mountain. <laughs> Uh, but uh, managed to pull out before it hit the bottom and Mussolini was saved and, uh, and then was taken back to Berlin to meet Hitler. Uh, so this was quite a propaganda coup, the, the Grand Sasso glider raid. Uh, we move on to 1944, the huge invasions. The um, experience in Sicily had not discouraged the Allies from using gliders. In fact, they basically improved their technique and kept on producing more and more. And... Um, so in the Normandy invasion on D-Day, there were six major American airborne attacks. And of course, lots of paratroopers going in, but all, most of the heavy equipment had to be taken in by glider. And so you had 500 US gliders. They took in 95 howitzers, 290 vehicles, which means Jeeps, 238 tons of cargo. So ammunition, that sort of supplies, and 4,000 men. Um, and this picture here shows uh, what was called Pegasus Bridge. So this is right over on the eastern side of the Normandy pocket. And there was a, a large canal coming down and capturing this bridge was absolutely vital to stopping the Germans from counterattacking back across it. And so six of these so-called horse arc gliders, they're a British glider, um, came roaring down, or they're not roaring, gliding <laughs> silently down and landed right in the field, right next to the bridge, and the bridge was taken by the SAS. And uh, uh, Pegasus is the, uh, I think today, still the symbol of the SAS, uh, which is why they call it Pegasus Bridge. Um, so uh, another very important use of all the gliders' uh, key attributes. And uh, uh, funnily enough, the the, this painting doesn't show that the Germans had actually put anti-glider poles in this field. Uh, they were called Rommel's Asparagus. And um, uh, the Germans were well aware of the potential of gliders and they, they sewed um, poles about the size of fence posts, but maybe two metres tall all over the place. Uh, anyway, the, the, the Pegasus Bridge gliders got down okay. As you can see, very often these wooden gliders would, would crack in half. They actually had a production joint on the middle anyway, and they, they were often unbolted by the crews in order to take out a Jeep or something anyway. Um, 
yeah so the but the glider assault in in um in d-day was an enormous success um here's another picture taken of a museum uh glider with uh, the you can see how the troops are seated in uh, and the pilots at the front and the flip up nose in the uh the wacko glider um the next the the battles after Normandy went fairly well, and although the gliders were planned to be used several times, they weren't required. The, the, the glider was sort of a, a weapon for getting over the top of a major defence line, and the Germans were in, unable to set up a major defence line until they got all the way back to the Rhine River. And um, so Montgomery forged a plan called Market Garden, um, which was a, a very bold plan. In fact, I, I think Montgomery wasn't a very bold general. It was probably the plan was probably pressed on him by the um, airborne people who uh, would have been itching to get into action and hadn't had a chance to do anything more. Uh, but the idea was they actually wanted to capture an 80 kilometer long corridor right into German territory that included six major river crossings. And um, the Arnhem Bridge was the, um, the last, the sixth of the, of the bridges, the last one across the Rhine. And uh, those who know the history will know that the, the assaults were very successful on five of the six bridges, but the sixth bridge failed to be captured uh, because bad luck, the Germans actually had a panzer division uh, resting in Arnhem when the paratroopers and the glider troops came down amongst them. And uh, the airborne troops just weren't equipped to handle uh, defending against a, an armored uh, counterattack that they faced immediately. Um, so it was sort of bad luck. But anyway, the, uh, the statistics of, uh, Market Garden are just amazing. This picture shows you the uh, there are horses in the background here and there are wackos all over the place. They had 1,600 American gliders. There were 600 British gliders. So the British ones were typically the horses and the uh, Americans were typically the wackos. And um, Walter Cronkite, who you would know as a famous newsman uh, from American TV news, he was a war reporter. And he actually went into action in Market Garden as a reporter in a glider. And he later made the quote, he said, uh, as a way to go to war, he said, march, swim, crawl, anything, but don't go by glider. <laughs> Apparently it was quite a frightening ride. Um, amongst other things, you can imagine so many gliders all trying to come down in one field. They, they don't have any ability to go around or change their approach. And so, uh, there were lots of collisions occurred, you know, that the people getting out of one glider would be surrounded by other gliders sliding to a halt all around them, or uh, you could just imagine the chaos. And uh, anyway, uh, another um, use by Allied gliders uh, was during the so-called Battle of the Bulge in December of 44. And um, you'll be aware that not only did the Germans hold their defence line on the Rhine, but they actually then attacked back into Belgium uh, around Christmas time uh, and took the Allies completely by surprise. Uh, but very fortunately, there were American uh, uh, troops were holding the, uh, the town of Baston. And they managed to hang on, which was a critical crossroads in the German advance. And... Um, they were resupplied by glider and also by uh, paratroop drop. And the gliders flew in with uh, ammo, surgeons, fuel uh, and medicines. And so were able to keep the pocket uh, surviving. And this um, little souvenir card is signed, I think, by several of the glider pilots and um, shows their view of the American, anti uh, sorry, the, the German anti-aircraft pumping away at the American gliders as they came in. Um, however, uh, gliders are actually, uh, fairly damage tolerant aircraft but because they're made of just wooden tubes uh, and they have no engine um, unless you hit the pilot or you can take out by luck one of the control cables or something um, they're actually pretty hard to bring them down and um, and so the, the gliders got through the uh, the flak and, uh, and managed to resupply Bastogne and the uh, the Germans lost the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, the Germans also tried to use gliders uh, for resupply of uh, surrounded pockets of people and uh, for example, this is in Budapest. And uh, so here you see a, a building in Budapest with a, a DFS 230 crash into it. Um, I can only assume that the, uh, the pilot actually would have escaped from this one. <laughs> a bit hard to say. Uh, 
that you can see that uh, flying a glider into a uh, uh, an ur urban area, especially one under shell fire, uh, would have been a very fraught experience uh, you could, because you, you've got no ability really to do anything except go down and get in and, and try not to hit the uh, rubble or obstacles. Um, the the Allies then used a another glider force, not as big as the Market Garden force, but uh, in a way this was the uh, they called it Operation Varsity, and it, it certainly was the final graduation of the Allied um, airborne and glider forces. Uh, they really had their act together by then, and. Um, this was the Rhine River crossing. Uh, and you can see here, this is a Hemelcar glider, which was designed to carry large uh, vehicles and, and large cargo. And uh, this Bren carrier had been brought in by that glider. Um, and maybe that motorbike as well. Uh, anyway, the, the, uh, the Rhine crossing went, went very well and the Germans uh, basically uh, collapsed from there on and, and, and the allied troops uh, went across to their, their objectives on the Elbe River. Um, uh, but not Berlin, which of course, as we, we now know, became, you know, part of East Germany. So, um, meanwhile, <laughs> back on the German side, um, the Messerschmitt 163, uh, an amazing aircraft, a, a, a true sort of technological breakthrough. Um, the German interest in gliders uh, had produced um, a great deal of aer aerodynamic knowledge about gliding and uh, the Germans also were working on rocket engines and they got the idea of sticking the two together and so what you had was basically a swept wing glider um, which was rocket powered to get off the ground and up to altitude uh, but then basically operated as a glider uh, you know would dive through the American bomber formations and then light up the rocket again and um, uh, gain altitude and then glide through again at very high speed. Um, the, the amount of rocket fuel on board was only a few minutes so uh, it basically had to make a vertical climb to altitude and then they had very limited uh, ability to loiter and uh, so they were a point defense weapon. They, were, they tended to be located near the German uh, oil refineries. Um, th there's a number of interesting things about this that the uh, they actually set a world speed record uh, clandestinely, they didn't announce it to the world, but uh, using the rocket in level flight, uh, about a thousand kilometers per hour, they broke through the thousand kilometer per hour barrier. And, um, but also the, the rocket engine was tiny and the fuel tanks were in the center of the plane. But the, you can see the labels on here, T and C, there were two different sorts of fuel. And the Germans had, uh, basically the fuel would explode on contact. That is the, the rocket motor just put the two fuels together. And um, it was incredibly dangerous that they had to like load one fuel into the plane and hose everything down and then get that fuel tanker well away, you know, uh, and then the other fuel tanker would then approach and then, then they'd fuel the plane again and then they'd hose it down again. And um, then it was ready to take off. And uh, it was only, again, they had a little wheel dolly underneath which was dropped after takeoff and they landed on a a, a skid to, to land the glider and so the whole thing was uh, uh, very uh, <laughs> very dangerous very very dangerous there were a lot of accidents and Hannah Reich again appeared as a test pilot um, on the ME 163 and uh, had a serious accident and was nearly killed her um, uh, she suffered uh, severe facial industry injuries and uh, uh, her life was saved actually by by uh, basically the best surgery the Nazis could organize for her. Um, and another problem was that on landing, uh, if any of the fuel was left, sometimes a heavy landing could, could make the plane explode. And if the plane pranged, um, the, the pilots were actually given rubber suits to wear, like a, like a skin diving suit, um, which was meant to try and keep the fuel off them. But if the fuel leaked in, it could actually melt the pilot. <laughs> and... and uh, very amazingly, some of the pilots died melted by their own fuel. Um, however, the, by, this, by the stage the 163 was operational, the, um, the fuel supply of the hydrogen peroxide uh, was being bombed and um, it was very difficult for them to uh, do operations and only a few operations were undertaken. Um, and it got better than that even, that um, 
The Germans had another uh, project uh, called the Fiesler 103 Reichenberg. And the Reichenberg, uh, I've said it's too Nazi even for the Nazis. <laughs> um, notice the person here, Hannah Reich, once more. Um, in 1944, she went to see Hitler and she proposed suicide glider bombs. So you can see that the Nazis were, um, were really scraping for ideas about how they could uh, get, get the uh, upper hand back in the war. And Hitler agreed to this, the suicide glider bombs. Um, however, they, they realized that they had uh, the V-1 uh, missile technology around for the cruise, V-1 cruise missile. And they adapted it as a piloted, um, you can see the, the cockpit here. Um, they adapted it as a piloted uh, kamikaze aircraft, basically. And uh, they actually trained up pilots, and the pilots were trained using a glider version of this without the rocket motor, but they'd tow the, uh, the Reichenberg off the ground, and then the pilots would glide it back to, uh, to practice control of the aircraft. Uh, however, I think in the end they said this is completely crazy, and uh, they had no operations, so uh, it, it never went anywhere else. Um, and back on the Allied side, um, in Germany though, uh, in the famous uh, prisoner of war camp called Kolditz, which was a, uh, a high security castle uh, perched up on the top of a huge rock, uh, which uh, only the, the worst allied escapers were uh, confined in this castle. But by confining all the escapers in one place, you're basically creating a, a university of escape techniques. And uh, some of the, the British guys, including a, a chap from Kenya, um, designed and built a glider in the attic. They actually managed to plaster off a section of, of the attic of the castle uh, completely without being discovered and then uh, merrily built their glider. They used uh, the wooden boards out of their bed uh, for, um, <laughs> for structural elements and they used the um, German uh, blue and white checked cotton bed sheets and uh, they made a dope to uh, you know basically to varnish the, uh, the bed sheets and make them stretch into a skin. And um, yeah, so this is, this is the only picture that is known of the, the completed glider. It was never used uh, to, as an escape device. Uh, the uh, escape committee at Cold, it's actually decided to hang onto the glider in case it was needed to communicate with allied troops. But the castle was liberated in the end uh, without any need to use the glider. And they, they would have had to assemble the glider on the roof of the castle and then use a, a bathtub full of concrete on a pulley to act as a catapult to launch it <laughs> and um, the although this glider never flew um, uh, the BBC made a documentary some years ago I think you can still see it on YouTube where they actually built a repro of the glider and they actually launched it from Colditz Castle and successfully landed it uh, on, on in the valley down below and and so it would have uh, it would have been a perfectly good escape method to get over the wire of the POW camp And the war was over in Europe, but it was still going on in the Pacific. And in Burma, um, gliders were really extensively used uh, for a, a procedure that the Allied had, sort of like island hopping, except on land, that they would go behind the Japanese lines and then establish an airborne base, fly gliders in overnight, and basically establish a defensive perimeter and make a defended location, which the Japanese were uh, then presented with a quandary of how to get rid of it, uh, if, you know, to try and attack it. They, they were actually quite well defended by this time. And um, so th this, this um, hopping from airstrip to airstrip, uh, extensively used gliders to, uh, to supply all the heavy equipment. And um, they included flying in mules and apparently the mules had their voice boxes taken out surgically. They were debrayed so that the mules wouldn't make noise while the gliders were flying over the top of the Japanese lines, would you believe? <laughs> and then um, you've got all these gliders laying around inside their little um, airstrip perimeter. Um, they were actually removed overnight by DC-3s, which flew down very low with a hook on them and basically snatched the glider on a tow rope at night. <laughs> um, I've got a picture here of the snatch technique. So uh, what you need is here's your glider. Uh, you put the tow rope into a wire loop and you have um, poles 
and the poles often had lights on them at night. And then your DC-3 pilot uh, then zooms along uh, only a few meters off the ground, snags the loop, and away we all go. And uh, the only thing you really need, the only other ingredient to make this work is everyone needs to be 18 years old and not afraid of death. <laughs> um, it, it's hard to believe how, uh, and, and the glider pilot has to sit here waiting for this um, DC-3 to whiz over his head and then suddenly jerk him away. And um, I don't know about accidents, but you, you can imagine that this, this procedure must have been just fraught with peril. But um, just after the war ended, or actually not even after the war, it was actually still rolling on. But th this is in New Guinea. The, the fighting was over and um, a, a, an American C-47 went on a joy flight uh, up from uh, what was then called Dutch New Guinea, but it's now Indonesian Papua. And um, they were flying up over the, the mountains and um, uh, sadly they crashed. They, they went into a, a cloud that was full of rock and they actually crashed in a place called the Shangri-La Valley, uh, which is called Beliem in modern day parlance. And this is a picture of the valley. It's a, um, it, it, it was populated valley, but, but the, the people in the valley had never had contact with the outside world. So this was a first contact. And um, although 21 people were killed in the crash, there were three survivors, which was a nurse and two airmen. And uh, the, the natives in the valley uh, basically helped them down from the crash site and um, uh, basically gave them shelter and, and food and uh, then search planes found them uh, in the valley and paratroops uh, jumped in to provide medical assistance and a glider was flown in to land in the valley and then snatched out. They basically set up a snatch arrangement and the DC-3 came in and pulled them out. And uh, here are the three survivors and uh, you can see the glider was called the Fearless Faggot. <laughs> so uh, one of the things I really enjoyed about researching this glider thing was there's, there's so many bits of history you've never heard before. They're just amazing. Now, what sort of man would crash land a wooden crate into a battle zone? Um, here's a picture of a wacko losing its wingtip on a, on a landing. Now, look, here's a man who did this. His name was uh, Jackie Coogan. And um, he, he had a few other strings to his bow. Um, he played in Charlie Chaplin movies as the kid. That's Jackie there. Um, during World War II, he was a sergeant glider pilot, but he was also married to Betty Grable, a famous uh, calendar pinup uh, model and movie star, I believe. And um, this is a picture of uh, Betty's legs being cast into concrete on Hollywood Boulevard. They're still there if you want to go and see them. And that's Jackie helping her, them uh, drop his wife into the concrete. And uh, Jackie went on to play Uncle Festa in The Adams Family. And so uh, that's the sort of person who becomes a glider pilot. Anyway, uh, the Americans built up a truly enormous number of gliders for the potential invasion of Japan. And, uh, but as we know, the, uh, the atom bomb uh, was dropped and the Japanese surrendered and there, were, there was no invasion. Um, and so the gliders didn't have to be used. But meanwhile, the Japanese were actually using another glider design. Uh, they had actually implemented the kamikaze glider idea that the, uh, the Germans had been tinkering with. And um, this is a so-called Oka or cherry blossom uh, rocket boosted suicide glider. The idea was that they'd be launched standing off from the American uh, ships some distance and uh, the pilot, pilot would glide um, into range and then he'd light up his rocket and he'd dive straight into the ship. And uh, these things were a frightening weapon. Uh, they, they sunk quite a few ships and uh, they were extremely hard to deal with um, the best way to defend against them was to try and knock down the, the, uh, the carrying bomber before they got into range. Um, yeah, so anyway, but the, uh, so they were the last glider attacks of World War II was uh, uh, suicide attacks. The, uh, the Americans codenamed it as Baka, which is Japanese for foolish. Uh, but, but in a way, this, this, this appealed to the, the Japanese um, uh, warrior spirit the kamikaze uh, weapon. And um, however, the, the gliders, despite the enormous uh, production of these things and, and, and uh, enormous work being put into working on how to use them, all of a sudden at the end of World War II, they disappeared from the inventories of, uh, of all the major powers. And um, the reason was, of course, that helicopters came along and helicopters basically could 
do the cargo lifting job or troop lifting uh, that got gliders had been used for up until then. And uh, basically they, they successfully took over uh, that part of the battle space. Uh, but of course you can't do a silent attack with a helicopter. But um, that was the one, the one attribute of gliders, gliders they weren't able to uh, continue with. And that I think, yes, is the end of the slideshow. So, Rod, you've got the uh, you've got the stalk up behind you at the moment on your background. <coughs> yes, I have. Let's uh, get rid of him. There we are. There it is. Um, James, I had the question. The question was the five-engined um, HE one 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 that yep. had the two bombers joined together. Did they yep. have two pilots? No, there was only one yeah, pilot. They... It was flown from one of the one of the fuselages. And apparently the flight engineer sat in the other fuselage. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, the, now, the, I don't know, the, but the, the, the Germans actually tended to have backup um, control arrangements. Like, you know, the uh, on the Heinkel 111, in just the normal bomber, the twin-engine bomber, um, the pilot had his controls, but he could flip that over to the other side uh, for the observer to actually pilot the plane if necessary in an emergency or, or just to give him a rest. And so I imagine that in the in the twin, um, the Heinkel 111 Zwilling, um, probably the flight engineer in the other fuselage would have had controls as well, so that um, you would have had some backup piloting if something happened. But I, I don't I don't even know it, that, but I'm, I'm guessing that would be what they would have done. Because it would have been terribly diffi difficult to coordinate two pilots and <laughs> two separate. No, no. Well, it's, it's, sure. the control pilot was only in one situation. Yeah. 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 And, and the other, not so much a question, but a comment. And that's, um, it, it's funny that the Germans turned around and said, no, nah, this, this idea of having um, kamikazes is, is just too crazy. But then the Japanese were <laughs> able to implement it. So. <laughs> well, I, I think um, the, the Japanese got to the situation where the Americans had 6,000 ships and the Japanese had no ships or next to none. And the Japanese had 6,000 aircraft. And so unless you can trade one aircraft for one ship, uh, you can't win. So that's what they did. Thank you. Uh, James, did they have uh, any communications on board? On the gliders? Yes. Uh, they had a telephone through the, through the tow rope. They could talk to the towing plane. Um, right. But, but uh, typically the towing plane would say to them something like, you know, oh, we'll be at the target in five minutes or, or it's getting too hot, we're letting you go now. <laughs> <laughs> Adios and good luck. <laughs> On that number 163 rocket glider, I'm surprised the OH and S people didn't say something about it melting the, uh, the, the pilot. That would have been uh, yeah, look, hard I think, to get, I think hard to get volunteers. The government, there wasn't that, all that much OH and S going on. Uh, yeah, I, I can sort of feel it like that. <laughs> Terrible. Yeah. Um, however, I must say that despite the fact these were very dangerous aircraft, um, quite a few of the top German pilots had their lives saved by being converted to uh, jets and rockets and then not being able to operate. Uh, whereas the guys that were left behind flying the propeller jobs uh, got hacked out of the sky by the enormous Allied Air Forces. So uh, many of the aces who survived the war um, were sitting in training schools at the end of the war for these okay. aircraft. Yeah, I think you'd be hard pressed to get volunteers for it today. <laughs> yeah, well, it's uh, you, you probably know that we're on the verge of having a drone based air force. So, you know, that's uh, you, you don't have these issues of uh, OHS at all anymore. Oh yeah, know all about that. My son's that uh, is a PhD mechatronic engineer, and he works for the Defence Department doing exactly that. Yeah, right. Yeah, so the one called the Loyal Wingman is now flying, and uh, that's meant to fly in formation with the F thirty five. But before too long, they'll just basically have a remotely piloted or uh, automatic fighter, and that'll be it. No more fighter pilots. Yeah, and um, they're doing the same with uh, underwater gliders. Uh, He's been working on that for years, yeah, yeah. Uh, unpowered. Like it just, uh, they just move ballast fore and aft and it, it drops and goes forward. Then they move the ballast aft and it rises and it sort, sort of can go around and then it comes up 
to the surface for a GPS fix and it goes back down again. Yes, yes. Yes, so uh, uh, by the time our submarines are ready in 20 years' time, <laughs> there'll be lots of uh, automated sharks swimming around to make life difficult for them. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's, it's funny that they're even thinking about it, but, you know, what can you say? Well, uh, hopefully, that we'll be the ones building the sharks and then we can forget about the full submarines in 15 years' time, so we'll see. Yeah, we'll probably break another contract. I don't know. <laughs> Is there any um, is there any plans to um, or is there any forward thinking about where to go after the F thirty five? Well, like I say, that the um, more than likely they'll they'll go to unmanned stealth aircraft. So you know you can uh, the pilot in the aircraft uh, creates all sorts of um, system requirements and, and you know liabilities. Uh, you know can't pull more than so many G and so on. So. Um, not having a person in it, you know, gives you actually a, a more dangerous uh, combat aircraft if it can do target identification and that sort of thing. And, um, you know, we're, we're rapidly moving to the point where the uh, uh, artificial intelligence can do that sort of job. So, and, and also you can make them much more cheaply. So you can have uh, 500 drones can um, certainly get the job done, even if you lose half of them. It doesn't matter. Except we'll probably be getting the uh, the GPS components for it from Huawei. <laughs> yeah, well, that's right. <laughs> uh, that's you know, right. Everybody's uh, battle plans include taking out the opposition's GPS systems one way or another. Yeah. Yeah, but that's that's basically a non-problem if you have a, a decent inertial navigation system. Yes. Yes. Yeah, you know, the the modern uh, guided bombs have both GPS and inertial in them. So the idea is it it, it takes a fix and it uh, guides itself in. But if the GPS goes out for any reason, it can still land on inertial uh, guidance. Yeah, the uh, it's uh, kind of hard to understand why you'd buy a whole bunch of submarines that you got a man when you've got four four or so submarines now that you can't man. <laughs> Well, maybe, maybe all the publicity will attract uh, young people to the submarine service. You never know. Well, it'll keep you, the South Australian economy going for a while. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Now, Rod, your background there the, of the stork, um, amazingly, the um, the daughter of the pilot of that stork, uh, who, by the way, he was a famous glider pilot as well, um, that daughter lives in Melbourne. And... Um, it turned out that one of the three squadron uh, World War II boys was in the nursing home where she's working and uh, they struck up a conversation one day and um, uh, ended up <laughs> uh, getting some of his photos out of his photo album. Of, uh, Is that, that's three degrees of separation, isn't it? Yeah, well, it's, it's, it, if you know too much, uh, you know, if you do too much research, you end up finding all these weird coincidences, yes. <laughs> Stochasticity. <laughs> Any other questions? It, it's interesting. Oh, oh hang on, what is it? Yeah, it's interesting to note the kamikaze side of things. I, when I was in Japan, I went to a military naval uh, establishment on an island, and they had outside a kamikaze submarine. Yes, and, yes, they had submarine versions as well. Yeah, yeah, and they had uh, the side cut out, and inside where the guy would sit, it looked like a a messy Ferguson tractor seat, a metal metal one shaped, just just like it. And I thought that'd be bloody uncomfortable. And then it dawned on me the guy wouldn't really be the last thing on his mind. <laughs> well, well um, a, imagine imagine uh, those ones that were trained and were actually going to do it. It's just mind boggling. Yeah, look, I think that the Japanese did try to deploy uh, some uh, kamikaze submarines to some of the American base atolls, you know, back in, like, the Philippines area. Um, and I th I, I'm pretty sure that they, they actually attempted to make an attack. I think they might have sunk one or two ships, but it was a long way from being as successful as the airborne kamikazes. Hmm. The airborne kamikazes sunk about 400 ships, I think. I had no idea there were so many gliders used in the war. Incredible. Thanks for that. Yeah, good. Yeah. yeah I mean, it amazed me as well. When, you know, the uh, 
incredible sort of uh, coming out of nothing and then going back to nothing all, all during the course of the war. A wonderful talk. Thanks. And James, what's your next project then? This is fantastic. What, what, what are you researching now? Oh, Rod, should I tell him? <laughs> it's up to you, James. <laughs> 